Hello, this is Mr. Gilmore with the 3.3, the isosceles triangle theorem lesson. Today we're going to prove a theorem that will come in handy the rest of the year. It is known as the isosceles triangle theorem. To us, it will be ITT. Now, now that we have the ability to prove two triangles are congruent with the side angle side congruence postulate, this is going to carry us into our next theorem, our isosceles triangle theorem. And again, it's all thanks to this property of congruence, because with congruence, we take three pieces of information, and through congruence, we can turn it into six using CPCTC. So you're going to see, at the end of our lesson, we will actually prove the isosceles triangle theorem together. Before we begin, though, we must then define what is an isosceles triangle. By definition, an isosceles triangle has at least two sides of equal length. So if we take a look at our diagram below, we have an isosceles triangle ABC with the two sides AB and AC equal to each other. Now, if we unravel the definition just a bit, if you take a look, it does say at least. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Before we get into that, those two phrases, that those two words, that phrase at least, let's dive into dissecting our isosceles triangle. So the isosceles triangle, we cut it into some jargon that we're going to be using. So for example, in the diagram below, we're going to call that the, this third side, which is not the pair of sides that are equal, this side we're going to call the base, okay? Which means the angles that are formed at that base are going to be called the base angle. So angle B and angle C are known as the base angles. In the diagram as well, we have a third angle, which is the angle that is sandwiched in between the two pairs or two sides that are equal. We call that the vertex angle. So the vertex angle is going to be that angle that are, is in between the two pairs of equal sides or two two sides that are equal. And then our very last piece of vocabulary that we, as we dissect our isosceles are the two sides that are equal. We call those the legs. So once again, diving into this diagram, I see that we have the legs, which are AB and AC. The third side, which is not the legs, we call the base, which then the angles formed on that base are called the base angles, leaving us with the angle that's in between the two legs, and we call that the vertex angle. Now go back to that phrase, at least. What does that mean for us? It means yes. An equilateral triangle is isosceles. Equilateral meaning all sides equal. But if we have a triangle with at least two sides being defined as isosceles, since our equilateral has three, then yes, an equilateral triangle is also an isosceles triangle. Now, what does that mean for at least when we talk about the base, right? What about the legs? What about the base angles and the vertex? It becomes a relative it actually becomes a relative uh, choice. If I were to choose AB and AC as the legs, then that would mean that BC would have to be the base, making angle B and angle C the base angles. And that would then make angle A the vertex angle. Okay, But it's relative. I didn't have to pick those two sides. I actually could have come back here, and let's say I picked these two sides as my as my legs. If those are my legs, that means it makes A B the base, which means A and B would be the base angles, and angle C would be the vertex. So it all depends on which two sides you want to call the legs will then determine where or how our jargon is used to dissect our isosceles triangle. But yes, by definition, an equilateral triangle is in fact isosceles, which we will see a theorem on the worksheet uh, involving an equilateral triangle. Now, let me introduce you to our phenomenal theorem today known as the isosceles triangle theorem, or to us, ITT. Here's what it says. If two sides are equal in a triangle, then the angles opposite those sides are equal as well. Meaning, in our triangle here, triangle ABC, we have two sides equal, AB equals AC. When we say angles opposite, we mean if we were to actually to uh, stand on our side and look at the angle opposite of it, we'd be looking at angle C here if I'm standing on side AB. What then is the angle opposite of side AC? We're looking at angle B. So in our setup, we are given that oh, we have this triangle ABC with AB is equal to AC. However, we are going to prove that angle B and angle C, these base angles, are in fact equal to each other. Today we be also begin something new in proof we begin to make additions on our diagram. 
So we're given this triangle, triangle ABC, with our two sides being equal, and we're going to prove that the base angles are also equal. What we can do, though, with a diagram is we are allowed to construct on that diagram. What does that mean to construct? What could we create or add to our diagram? Well, in fact, we are actually allowed to add many sort of constructions to our diagram. Here's a small list of things that we could add. For example, if I am given any segment, I know a segment always has a midpoint. Because of the ruler postulate, I'm allowed then to create a midpoint. So if I give you a segment, you can construct a midpoint on that segment, and you're allowed to do that. The ruler postulate measures and make measures. What if you're given an angle? All angles have an angle bisector, which means you're allowed to construct that angle bisector. That's the protractor postulate. So why is that true? The protractor postulate. Angle bisectors you can create. That's a construction. Another thing you can construct, you can construct a line or a segment. We know that through any two points there exists a line. That's the line existence postulate. So these postulates give us the ability to construct. So if you're given any segment, you can throw a midpoint on it. You're given any um, angle, you can construct its angle bisector. If you are given any two points, you may construct a segment from them or construct the line through them. We will have other types of constructions later. We'll talk a, talk a look, take a look at how we can actually construct parallel lines and also perpendicular lines later on. So what are we going to do with these constructions? We are going to take our isosceles triangle, triangle ABC, with our two legs, AB and AC being equal, and we're going to apply the protractor postulate to bisect an angle. Now, not just any angle in our diagram, but specifically the vertex angle. And, hey, vertex, it's an angle, which then means we can actually bisect it. That's Remember, given any angle, we can cut it in half. So we construct this angle bisector. It technically is this ray that goes from point A, and it cuts the angle BAC right in half, and it continues to go on. It juts right through the other opposite side of our triangle there. It just keeps going on. But what we're then going to do is we just truncate it, right? We cut that off, that extra part of our ray, to say really we only need to focus on the remaining part as it intersects our opposite side of the triangle, and we'll label that intersection point D, right? There's a point there, so we'll label it point D, that leaves us with the segment, segment AD. So segment AD is representing that angle bisector. This does something phenomenal for us. On our last slide, we're going to jump into the proof of the, tri of the isosceles triangle theorem. Now, because this is a virtual slide, I actually then created the two-column proof already and put our reasonings, our, our statements and reasons into the two-column. But we're going to walk through it together because hopefully you've noticed now something that's really special about this, this diagram. When we cut that angle in half at the vertex, notice that it took our triangle ABC and it cut it actually into two smaller triangles, ABD and ACD. Hmm. I wonder if we can prove something special about those two smaller triangles. Let's take a look. So here is our proof of the isosceles triangle theorem. So with our proof, we again start off with our given. Triangle ABC with, our, with AB and AC being equal. That's our given. But what did we then do to our diagram? We bisected angle A with the segment AD. Now notice what the reason is. Look at the other reason is over here. I put the reason construction. Here's the thing. We're going to encounter a lot of different constructions. And instead of using the specific postulate, because we're going to have a lot of them, I'm going to allow you to use this simple word of construction. So whenever you were to create a midpoint or make an angle bisector or connect two points and, and call it a line or a segment, you can then justify it by just simply saying the word construction. So we constructed something. We bisected angle A with our segment AD. What follows then from an angle bisector? Well, angle bisectors cut angles right in half. So look at step three. I can claim now that angle BAD and angle CAD are equal to each other. That's the definition of angle bisector. Why am I declaring those equal? Well, because remember, I mentioned just before that that angle bisector actually divides our entire triangle ABC into two smaller triangles, ABD and ACD. 
those two triangles are provably congruent. Here's why. We're given already one pair of equal sides. With the angle bisector, we're now provided with another pair of equal things. We have equal angles there. As it turns out, these two smaller triangles, ABD and ACD, they share a common side, AD. And because they share a common side, we can call that side equal to itself by reflexivity of equality, which then means we've set up congruence. We have this beautiful ability to prove triangles congruent now. Side, angle, side, side, angle, side. We have that now to declare the two triangles, ABD and triangle ACD, congruent by the side angle side congruence postulate. This opens the door for more information. Remember that through congruence, we get more information. We went from three pieces with these two triangles to six pieces instantaneously because of CPCTC. Corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent, which then means what can I say about angle B and angle C? Well, angle B and angle C have to be congruent to each other because take a look at our corresponding parts in our congruent statement. Angle B and angle C, they are corresponding, which means we can call them congruent. And that means we have equal angles. So there we have it. We have proven that the isosceles triangle theorem is true, that whenever we're given an isosceles triangle, the angles opposite those equal sides are themselves equal. We will use this result over and over and over again. So be on the lookout now for isosceles triangles. They will pop up everywhere. And we love encountering isosceles triangles because that gives us more information. We now know that those base angles are in fact equal to each other. This concludes the end of our 3.3 .3 lesson on ITT. Please be sure to look at that worksheet. If you have any questions, email me. With that, be good and do good.